Uh, I was recently scared two times pretty uniquely um, around this whole idea of Halloween. One happened this morning, actually. I was getting coffee, and I was, um, I was, uh, <laughs> I was walking, and it's kind of like a downtown area. And all of a sudden, I hear like the whizzing sound of something like getting faster and faster and faster to me. And I was like, ooh, this is not good. And, uh, in, and I kind of just got like tensed up, and I hear <laughs> this like, I don't know, kind of like croaky, raspy vo- kind of voice just go, where's the bus? stop and I was all oh god you know <laughs> and I was like uh, and um and I looked dude and then it was this dude you know probably had a rough night or month and he um and he uh but he was riding a bike that was like for someone that is like eight and it was like a pink bike so I know he stole it right I was like you stole that bike and I didn't realize it till after I was like oh you see that stoplight and he didn't even turn around. He just kept, this was it just him. Actually, this was him. And, uh, and he was like, he was just gone. And I was like, it's that stoplight down. And as I'm telling him like directions to take his stolen bike down uh, the, uh, the the train station, he said, we're, you know, and I was like, it's right there. He goes, all right, thanks. And then I was like, dude, did I just participate in like a crime? Like, am I a part of whatever is going to go down? Um, so that frightened me, but not... <laughs> That pales in comparison. I don't like, I'm jumpy. I don't like being scared. My wife knows this about me. Um, It's not funny to me to be scared. Like the whole, ha, like kind of stuff, like it's not funny. And I would not recommend you do it to me. Uh, There's a few people in my lifetime that learned that the hard way. And so, yeah, I just call it what it is. Bay Area boy grew up that way. Uh, I don't. I don't like to be scared, and I want to bring you in (laughs) to like my pain, my my um, suffering. I uh, was out with some friends um, this last weekend. My wife and I, we, went, we go out with this, this group um, from time to time. And we went out to this place. Uh, we were in L.A. And it's kind of like a, um, I don't know, like a performance, like um, based out of like some old Tim Burton movies. I don't know if any of you guys ever saw like Tim Burton movies or whatever. Some of you hate that and whatever. But um, uh, so we went there and I was kind of like, I don't know why, but I was either, I was, I don't know. I could have been trying to get my fantasy football team ready. I'm not sure what I was doing, but I was not paying attention okay I was not into the environment that was going on around me I was kind of in my own world do you ever find yourself like in your own world like you're not in the world you're in you're in another world though you're right there and that happened to me and um and I, and so uh there they did their sing it's like a theater sing song environmental while they serve you food thing it was, it was a lot of fun told I had a blast um, not this part of the night, though. Um, and I want to show you what happens when you, too, are not paying attention in the environment that you're in. It will be setting up today's message. You enjoy. That's... Yeah. Hello, Satan. I was like, oh my God. And what the video does not show is what my right fist was becoming. It was like going like this and I was like this and all of a sudden I went fist and I was like, no, 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 no. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then I like looked at Brenda and then had to force a smile on my face. So, you know, and as it was kind of funny because I was thinking about like what I felt um, we were going to be talking about today. And the idea for me is Halloween's fun. There's a lot into it that I just really enjoy. Um, uh, most people don't know that Halloween actually started as a um, faith-based holiday. You can look that up. It's, it's a really cool breakdown. I'm not going to go into it today. But I do, um, I do enjoy it. I think it's a fun, festive way to um, give great memories to kids and all the rest. And, but what I realized in this was that I paid for the fact that I was not paying attention. Okay, that I was not in the world that I actually was in. And I started thinking about like how this can happen to us, right? Like this can happen to us in a lot of different ways, not just like, uh, certainly not just like Halloween getting scared. It could happen to you um, with your finances. Like if you're not paying attention to your budget, all of a sudden it's like, ooh, what happened there? And it gets crazy. It could happen to you with your, your health, 
right? If you ignore and ah, it's fine, it's fine, I'm sure it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. All of a sudden you go to the doctor and it's not fine and it wasn't fine. And that first little inclination was like, no, 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 go check it out, go now, go soon, right? Uh, a relationship thing can happen, right? Where you're kind of like, hey, this, this, when it first showed up, it was kind of like, that's not enjoyable. I don't think I'm, we shouldn't be interacting like this as a marriage, or I don't know if that interaction with my teenager um, is the way we want to let this go, but it's kind of like, how do we fix it, repair it? How do we get it back? But you don't, you don't want to admit your part. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to admit how you contributed to it being like that. So instead of you owning your part of the discussion, you're holding out for them to own their part. Two people holding out. No one ever does anything to make it better. And before you know it, that one little instance goes from one moment that you could have corrected. Now, now it's like six months later, some of us six years later. And it just kind of became, before you knew it, the way your family, quote, does it. Right. And, and so this this kind of stuff can happen in our homes. We're just we're not seeing what is becoming. We're not paying attention. We're not we're not watching the face of the people we're talking to as they just kind of like get crushed inside from either our tone or even our face or the way our face looks. And and so I, I want um, for today, I want us to be able to consider that. Also, I mean, I, I do Halloween. You see like hooper, superheroes that are always uh, dressed up in costumes and stuff. And when I start thinking about um, the things that I might be missing, I'm drawn to the things that I, I, I don't want to go bad. But I, I want to talk about both. I want to talk about the things that can go bad because we're not paying attention. But I also want to talk today about the things that could be amazing, but we miss them. We miss them. They're, they're, we miss them, and they're these, almost because, like, I don't know about you, but I know I watch, like, these superhero movies, and I love them. And you watch them, and you almost start to think, in order for me to not just miss the good moments or the good parenting or the good leading or the good, you know, bossing or the good marriaging, whatever it is to be a good student, it's like, I don't want, I don't want these bad things to come. But I also have found that I, I have this idea of what it means to be the person that like my daughter says, she fills in my name in the box at school, who is your hero, right? Like I wanna be that person. I think we all do. I think we all wanna make an impact in someone's life. Either your friend, maybe you're in high school or college, like man, I would like my roommate or my friend or a teammate or someone I work with or certainly my kids or my husband, my wife. I want my child. I want them, if they were ever asked sometime in the next whatever, however many years, you would love it if the person they wrote the name in was your name. Who is your hero? And they said, you. And then I start to attach to that all these ideas of like my movies and what I've seen heroes do. And they're always epic, like epic moments like that require like an empire's amount of like finance to pull off the Batman level stuff that I've seen. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't have that. I'm not Bruce Wayne. I don't have the ability. I, I didn't get like bit by a spider. I don't have webs coming out of my wrists. Like I don't have the force but I wanna make a hero's difference. And I think part of what we can get, without knowing it, that we can get drawn into is this idea that in order to make this grand, great, amazing impact in people's lives, that the moment has to be big, grand, and great. And I think because of that, we miss it. We miss the stuff that can actually be right in front of us. And I wonder if they're not big moments happening all the time, but it's because they're disguised as small moments every day, right? And we just don't pick up on it or we don't take advantage of it because we've just never connected the dots and going, oh, that just seems so small. I would never even think I'm becoming a hero right now. But it's exactly what the people need from us in our lives. And so what I want to do today is I want to take um, the Bible and I want to zoom in on someone who is actually not a very well-known person. He's one of the lesser known people in the story of Jesus, but he was around, of course, I mean, arguably the most famous person ever, right? Um, this famous person, uh, his name gets said every day, one way or the other. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Almighty. Yeah, some of you guys, you guys hear that name, don't you? Yeah, it's not a prayer. But his name somehow got famous, and like his name gets prayed, and then his name gets said. But somehow, some way, every day, all the time, Jesus' name gets used. He's a very famous person, referred to often. And what I want us to do is to not just look, of course, I want to look into the story with Jesus, but this other person, lesser, not very widely known, is right there in the middle of it all, but you don't see it. 
and then what I think sometimes we do is we miss the people in this story that I want you to see today. And, and then we miss what we could become because we're too busy trying to do the grand part of the grand story. And that right in the middle of it, it's all because of a few people, some of these grand things happen. So with that said, I want to go to John chapter six. Everybody say there and then. Come on, say there and then. You can type it if you're watching online. Again, if you're new around here, you're just kind of getting into our thing. Uh, every week we, when we talk and teach from the Bible, we always handle it from the perspective there and then. What it means is we want you to hear what the world was like there and then when the Bible was written. Because if you don't understand the world the Bible was written into, then the words of the Bible won't really ever make that much sense to you. And I think the Bible is alive. I think it's a spiritual document. I think it's God's word. I believe that. And I think it will change your life. But I believe that that will happen to the measure that you understand it. So we want you to understand more. Every week I want you to leave going, mm, did not know that about the Bible and, and, and the story of Jesus and about God. And that's a big part of at least a personal goal for me as a preacher. So uh, with that said, what we've got here is Jesus in this area of, of the story. He has got a big crowd showing up to hear him. He's done a few cool things. He's done a few miracles. He healed a guy who was um, at a pool. And now we've got him uh, gone across somewhere else and, 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 and this massive crowd is showing up. Okay. And it's later in the day. Now, there is an interesting part to note here, is that there was a Passover festival. It was a Jewish uh, custom, not just then, still now. Uh, the, the, the Passover festival was ba based when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and, and God rescued them and pulled them out of Egypt. And one of the ways that that happened was the Passover of the day, where the, the, the angel of the death that went and over and was one of the plagues um, passed over all of their homes who put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. And so that is a festival. Now, this festival is interesting uh, because it, it lasts for eight days. Okay, so we'll get back to that in a minute, but uh, I want you to remember that kind of like as an idea. Verse uh, 5, John chapter 6, verse 5, this is what it says. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, this is really interesting right here, is that Jesus is engaging Philip. Now, I know some of you guys, Philip, that's it. Hold on. Um, uh, uh, he, he's, he's, he's talking to Philip, and he's looking at this massive crowd, and he's asking and inviting someone else to be a part of really kind of solving a problem. And he says this in verse 6. Uh, John wrote this about Jesus. He asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I love that part. I love that Jesus had the solution before they even had considered the problem, right? And I want to, I don't know who that's for. I don't know who needs to hear that today, but I want you to know that before you have even figured out what your real problem is, Jesus has already found the solution for you. He is already waiting for you and he is available. And that's the part of what we see in his character is we haven't even found our real problem and Jesus already has the solution ready. Now, often we won't see how things will end up, right? Like we don't see, if you just took a survey of Philip at this point of the story and you would have asked Philip, we're gonna get his answer here in a second, but if you would just pause the story and go, Philip, would you tell us real quick how do you see this playing out and what do you identify as the real purpose of whatever's going on? His breakdown of the events and what he perceives the events are gonna require and be about and the purpose of it all would be so different than what will become. And that's a part of our perspective. We are not God. So we will never be able to understand fully what it is because our view of things is so limited and it can be hard to trust God's heart when that is true when it is quite true that we're limited in our perspective. And that is where faith and trust comes in. It's like, I don't get it all. And I'm sure, you know, we'll talk about it in heaven someday. Uh, but I'm going to choose to trust because what else do I have? Uh, I, I'm going to walk with you and believe somehow, some way you are working something out. Now, uh, Jesus knows what he's going to do here. And I, I think this is interesting, but he involves the disciples in the process. I'm going to bore a few of you for about 90 seconds, but there's a few of you in this room I think need to hear this and watching online. Okay, um, if you are a boss, um, a leader, the head of a department, um, 
maybe even, shoot, a big brother, a big sister, um, a parent, whatever. Like if you have influence in someone else's life who needs to learn from you, you're a grandma, you're a grandpa, and you have access to being able to transfer information from one person's wealth knowledge to the next person, the next generation, the next employee, the next person down the line of the, the you know, the, the food chain or, or the org chart, they are dependent upon you. I want you to learn a little bit about the way Jesus does his instruction and how he teaches. He involves those he is teaching in the process of solving the problem. Some of you need to get out of the way. You always love to solve the problem right away and you don't know how to let people around you be a part of finding the solution. You want to tell them always what to do. We talked about parenting stages a couple weeks ago. That's appropriate in the first stage and the second stage up to a 10. It stops being like, just tell them what to do. It's no, no, no. You tell them what to do and you should be explaining why. And especially when you get up into the teenage years, you definitely still have the boundaries set up hopefully by the previous few stages if you did them right. If you didn't, you're right. It's going to be a harder, harder reel in of the boundaries that you let run away with these fish that are now running all over the ocean. And you're trying to reel this thing in with a thousand foot line. You're going to get tired. It's going to be hard, but it's the best thing to do. What we see here is that Jesus doesn't tell Philip the answer. He asks Philip the question. Hey, no, did you, did you hear it? He's, the Bible says he already had in his mind what he was going to do. So what do we know? He had the solution. Does Jesus ask Philip a question because he's not sure? No, he asked Philip a question because he is secure. He's secure in himself. He knows who he is. He doesn't need to prove that he's smarter than the average bear. He doesn't need to make sure they know that he's savior and he's God and he's truth. And you'd better recognize that I'm the one that has this living truth. That's not Jesus. I don't know if some level of Christianity or faith expressed to you that that's, he's waiting to just let you know how off you are. That's not Jesus. He actually is like, hey, Philip, man, where are we going to get bread, huh? Dang. (laughs) And then Philip's like, For real, though. (laughs) Philip answered in verse 7. This is what Philip says. Philip answers and says, It would take more than a half a year's wages, Jesus, to buy enough bread for everyone to just have a bite. (laughs) It's just one little bite, dude. Just a little morsel. Half a year's wage. I don't know what y'all make. Just take your yearly salary and cut that mother in half. Woo! Just to feed all these thousands of people. So Philip answers really, really well, actually, right here. It's a solid answer, but it does unveil the problem, which is half a year's salary. Big problem. And why is that? You guys want a little there and then bonus? Anyone? That was enough. That was about mm, one fifth of you. Um, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's fine. Um, Okay, a little bonus, a little there and then bonus. I told you it was a Jewish festival, right? The Passover festival, big deal. How many days was it? Test. Good, thank you. Some of you thought it, that counts too. God knows your thoughts. <laughs> um, and, and so eight days, you know what that means? Okay, that means that the laws of economics are at play right here. And so when Jesus is asking this question, he's asking a question there and then in their custom and context of what's going on. And you know what Philip answers is a brilliant Jewish response. He's Jewish. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. And they're like, you know what he's saying? Let me fill in all the blanks for you. This is what he says. Well, Jesus, you and I both know that the Jewish festival is coming up, which is eight days, which means nobody's making bread. Because they're not going to let their whole business die by sticking all the money into making bread that stays in the shop that they can't sell because everyone's at the festival for eight days. So you know what people stopped doing right up until the festival? They actually, they pared down all of their production. Supply and demand. Think Long Beach Harbor. Okay, you guys got it? Are you tracking? Everyone's with me now? Okay, he's going like this. He's like, look, bread is going to be so rare right now we're going to have to pay a higher cost to get this bread because everyone's preparing to go to the festival. There's so much happening here. It's so brilliant, and I love it. So Philip, man, he's answering. They're going back and forth, and they're talking about it, and it's this wonderful, practical way. But now I want to introduce us to the character that I really want to look into for the day. 
Verse eight, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Let's just pause there. Leave the verse up there for me. This, this, this is a, man, this is a preacher's verse right here, okay? Now, if you're not excited by this, that's good, okay? Um, Andrew is a very, 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 like, very insignificant person if you're only looking at what it means to be a hero in the 2021 context. If you project what our culture has taught us it means to do heroic events, then you will think that the only thing that you could do to be a hero is to do these grand gestures. And I'm not saying they're not. I think they are heroic. We're not saying grand gestures aren't heroic. We're just saying they're not the only thing that is heroic. And here we have Andrew. Andrew, who is the what again? He's the brother of Peter. You know what that means? Peter, I don't even care if you sit here or are watching online and you, you don't even know what you think about God, Jesus, the Bible, whatever it's all about. You probably have heard some joke about St. Peter at the pearly gates. You know this dude. You know Andrew's brother. You know who that, you know who that means Andrew is, right? He's the other brother. He's the other sister. He's the not as well-known one. He's not the captain of the football team, the head of the cheerleading. He's not the one with all the good grades. He didn't get the scholarship. He's not the one everyone knows. He's not heir apparent. He doesn't do anything really amazing. I would say this though, he doesn't do anything really amazing to the eye at first glance. No, he isn't quote outgoing, but he is caring. He isn't extroverted, but he is intentional. He isn't scared of big crowds. He's not intimidated by someone of influence. He isn't afraid of big moments. He just doesn't need to be the moment. That's Andrew. Andrew said this, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go? So he ain't really figured out what's in Jesus' mind yet. But you know what he did figure out? He figured out a few things that I think matter to the heart of God. He figured out how to make a boy feel safe and comfortable around him. He wasn't so busy being a grown adult that he didn't know how to make time for someone younger. He saw a child. He sees the teenager. He sees the next generation. They are not invisible to Andrew. Andrew pays attention to the small details. He sees the small moments. He sees the first time the shoe gets tied. He makes sure that the lunch is packed. He recognizes things. And let's not just speak about Andrew's investment in this, but there's another person in this story, not mentioned explicitly, but is in there. And you know who that is? It's that little boy's mom. That little boy's mom made sure he had what he needed for the day. She made sure that he had a little more than he needed because I don't know that he needs to eat two fish and five loaves of bread. That's a lot for a little boy. And you know what it teaches? It teaches that somehow that family created margin to be generous. They created a heart for others. And that little boy knew how to judge the character of someone like Andrew. And here's what we then see, the beauty and the power of Andrew's influence is he befriends, he identifies, he sees a boy who has been prepared by a a family system and specifically probably a mom for that day in that culture, sent out, but not sent out to be stingy, not sent out to hold on to all of his own, not sent out to be like, I don't know where this is going. Who's this Jesus guy? Hold on a second. I'm not going to wait a minute. This is mine. My dad worked hard. We earned this. This belongs to us. Nope. Hey, here's a boy. I don't know how it's going to go. I really don't see how this is going to help us, but I at least want you to see what it is. See, Andrew didn't do all the big flashy things. He is not known for the things Peter is known for. Andrew doesn't walk on water. (laughs) <laughs> Andrew isn't the one famous if you're a part of, of Bible reading and you've been around uh, the Bible or a faith in Jesus. He, G, Peter is famous for being the first person to say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked back to me and said, blessed are you, Peter, 
Simon, son of Jonah, for God revealed to you who I was and I will build my church on you. That was the interaction. Guess who that was about? Not Andrew. Andrew was there though. Can you imagine being the brother of the one who has all this flair and attention, is getting all this, all this opportunity, all this growth? But because Andrew knew who he was, he was not envious of what God was doing in Peter's life because he knew who God called him to be was what he was supposed to be. So he allowed Peter to flourish. He allowed Peter to prosper. He wanted Peter to prosper. He was there. You never see him judge Peter for Peter's big mouth and failings. Although I bet it was in there, every sister and brother in this room, we're like, mm, mm, mm. Hey, Peter. Remember when mom told us we needed swim lessons and you said no? <laughs> Saw you crying like a baby out there. Save me, Jesus, I can't swim. <laughs> Andrew doesn't do that. Andrew also didn't deny Christ while they were beating him right before the crucifixion. Peter did, but he also didn't get a chance to have breakfast with him the day after the resurrection where Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times. Why? Because Peter denied him three times. So for every failing, Jesus said, I'll forgive you. And I still got plans for you. None of that is true of Andrew. That's all true of Peter. But can I tell you what Andrew also did though? I want you to hear the verses in John chapter one. John chapter one, verse 40, this is what it says. It says, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, how long would it take for you to get annoyed being identified as Simon's brother, Peter's brother? Any, anyone listening online or watching or, or here today have someone who has the more um, gregarious, outgoing personality, easier to kind of spot. The talents and gifts they have are different than yours. You're a little more the Andrew of the personality and they're a little more the Peter. It's not like they say, Peter, Andrew's brother. <laughs> Peter's not Andrew's brother, but Andrew's gotta be Peter's brother. How do you think Andrew? But because we can identify Andrew was cool with it. You know why we know that? I'm gonna show it to you right here. This is what Andrew, he didn't walk on water. He didn't profess the Christ for the first time in the history of the world. He, he's not the one who, 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 who heals the crippled man in Acts chapter three. Peter's not, you know, Andrew, we don't have first or second Andrew. Andrew didn't get the right, nothing that ended up in the Bible. Peter gets it all. Well, Andrew just stays in the background paying attention to the people who just need to be cared for and loved and encouraged. Just doing the work of Jesus. And he brought him to Jesus, verse 42, and Jesus looked at Peter, not Andrew. I mean, wouldn't you think that the person who brought the person should at least get a little, like, kudo? Like, throw me a bone, Jesus. But he doesn't. He looks at Peter and says, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And this right here shows us a little bit about the heart, I think, the full heart that God has made us all with. Andrew isn't mentioned much, but the two things we mentioned today is him bringing people to Jesus. He brought his brother to Jesus and was not competitive. He was not angry. He was not jealous. He was not envious. You know why? He knew God had something for him. He didn't have to be mad at what God had for someone else. And he could be okay to celebrate the opportunity for his brother. And don't just stop at family system, brother. Because once you become a part of the body of Christ, the family of God, it's brother, sister inside the spiritual family. Do you get jealous, envious, frustrated, annoyed at other people being blessed, getting things you don't have? Because if you do, your heart will get blocked up. It gets clogged and you won't, be willing to do the stuff that Andrew does. You won't want Simon to prosper. You'll be irritated when he does. But he did bring Peter to Jesus. He loved people. He figured out who Jesus was before most others did. Did you see that? He discovered who Jesus was before anyone else really in his family knew. And then he befriended people who were around him. 
he was just someone who knew how to give attention and he wasn't afraid it wasn't like uh sometimes introverts or people who are like kind of behind the scenes people almost get this like idea like uh you're not fit for the big stage actually he ain't tripping messiah it don't get no bigger than that Okay, that is it. You name whoever you think is the most famous person that you'd be like, I can't believe I'm meeting you right now, right? Like whoever that is, that's Messiah to Andrew. He ain't tripping. He's like, dang, we done found him? Cool, let me go get my brother. But not just the big grand Messiah, but the unassuming, out of place little boy. He's got something in his heart for the grand and the great and the insignificant seemingly and the small. But see, that's where I think the beauty of how God wants us to see this really comes in because it is Andrew, no, it is not Andrew who walks on water, but Peter don't walk on water without Andrew. It, it, it is Jesus that, that takes this bread and it is this little boy that brought, and it is the mom that prepared it and it was the dad and the mom who taught this boy to have margin, to have enough and see if you've got some for others also and bring it to Jesus so Jesus can multiply it and get it to more people than you could have got it to. Little did that mom and dad know that what they were giving their child would be multiplied beyond what they were giving their child. So you got to remember that when you are a, par par a participant in the kingdom of God work, the math don't add up. It don't add up. My one plus one does not equal my two when I put it into the hands of a multiplying God. God is a multiplier. He will take your daily effort, your small effort, the things you speak into your family, into your children, into your husband, into your wife, into your grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, grandson, granddaughter, the work, the job, the things you do, your small prayers will be big because God is a multiplying God. He doesn't just do our math. He takes it and goes, now watch what I do with a few pieces is a bread and some fish. No way that mom and dad knew that was going to happen when they sent their child to school that day. And that right there is what it means to really put your faith and trust in a God who does more with the small. And Andrew and that boy at the end of this story, and you'll hear more about it next week, they go home with more than they brought because Jesus multiplies. You will always go home with more than you brought when you give to the hands of Jesus because he will multiply it and then go, by the way, I got some leftover from all the stuff I multiplied from your obedience and your sacrifice and your generosity. Here you go, go back. And am I just talking about, is this a giving talk? Oh, give and then God, yeah, I mean, that's all true, but that ain't what I'm talking about. You know what they went home with? Watching fish and bread freaking multiply. <laughs> Not a bad day. I've seen some cool movies. I've seen a few magic shows. I've been to Vegas and junk, but dang. Nothing up my sleeves, just like hustling fish and bread. Thousands of people. Not only that, but Andrew got to go home knowing I may never see that little boy again, but that little boy will never forget what they saw today. That's what it means to be about the next generation. That's why we do trunk or treat tonight. That's why we do kids ministry the way we do. That's why we ask so much of you to give and to be so generous so we can make sure we spend an inordinate amount of the money that God gives us at our city church on our young people. Why? Because they are baked in the whole story of Jesus. Constantly we see him making room and focusing on how do I make sure these kids can get closer to Jesus? How do I make sure we bring people there? And Andrew, he did seemingly small things that had such grand impact, the small things you do on a daily basis will have the biggest impact over time. And that right there is in the heart of the story of Jesus. How do we make this a part of our lives? I think practically speaking for you, uh, consider and think through, hey, who can I bring closer to Jesus? How do I be Andrew to just one person? If the only person Andrew ever would have brought to Jesus would have been Peter, think about how much impact Andrew had in the world. You don't have to be the hero that saves the whole city. What if you just save the hero? What if you're the reason that the hero became one? What if you're the reason they became a teacher, became a doctor, became a technician, became an, a pilot, went into service, got into law enforcement? What if you're the reason 
that they learned and they came along and they were believed in and inspired. And it's because you saw right in front of you the opportunity to go, I see this little moment might be just one conversation with this one little boy with a few fish and some loaves, but I will maximize this time. I will see you. I will pause for you. I will not be so busy on my phone looking at what I got to do, checking it all out to make sure that I miss what's happening right in front of I think this is the kind of church Jesus wants to build at our city church. How do I bring someone closer to Jesus? It's, yes, of course, get them in the church, share what God's doing in your life. I think that boldness is important, but not just that. It's also important for us to find them doing things that we know Jesus would go, that's what I'm talking about. Anytime you ever think God would go, that's what I'm talking about. Right there, there you go. Yes, that's awesome. Say it. Your thoughts have never encouraged anybody. Your words encourage, your, your words you write or the words you say, those encourage people. Practically, I would love you all to come tonight. I would love all of you to come tonight. Bring your kids, dude, bring the kids in your, like get the families around you, invite anyone and everyone you can. You know how many last minute people there are. There's so many people like me. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing tonight. They don't even have their costume yet. They're perfect. Go ask them. It's at five o'clock, we're gonna be there, it's gonna be fun, I, I want you to come. But I really want you to take this to heart. Um, where is the Peter in your life? And where is the little boy? Because Andrew's impact stretches from the one-time conversation to speak into the next generation to the unenvious, lack of pride, jealousy, pure-heartedness to go, hey, I'm gonna start rooting for you, man. I'm not gonna compete with you no more. I'm not gonna want bad for you in my heart. I mean, nobody would know that you want it, but if you were honest, you're like, well, I don't want good for you. And I really don't want you to be a part of this Jesus thing. I finally get my chance. I'm finally important. People finally will look up to me. People will finally see me for who I am. And you're ruining all that. I know as soon as you come in here, the way you are is gonna ruin that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I think Andrew would want coffee with you and to go, hey, uh -uh. I think there's a different way. I, I think there's a better way. Uh, I don't think your heart is gonna do well staying like that for the rest of your life. And you'll leak oil on the people around you and they'll learn that without you knowing you're teaching it. Let's not do that. Let's not have that heart. Let's have the heart that was in Jesus that certainly was in Andrew. I wanna lead you in a prayer. I'd like you to close your eyes if you would for a moment. I believe in the power of prayer and I think when we just say them out loud, they have impact. And so I'm gonna say a prayer uh, and I just want you to repeat it after me if you're okay with that. And this prayer really is just gonna kind of walk through, it's a guided prayer and it gives you a chance to walk through kind of what we learned today from the scripture and from God's word um, and to ask God to help us with this kind of stuff. And so would you say this prayer after me? Say, Lord, I want to be used by you to bring others closer to your love and your power. Show me how to see the big moments that are right in front of me every single day. Jesus, I commit my heart to recognizing and pouring into the next generation, one child, one teenager at a time. Remind me when I forget that I can make a big impact by doing small things with great intentionality. Use me and use our city church to impact the next generation. In Jesus' name. Can you imagine what would happen in our city if we just were that church weekly, daily? We will redefine, we will actually not redefine, we will define what a generation, a next generation, a younger generation defines as faith, as Jesus, as church, as Bible. And I said this to the all-in team in our, in our leaders huddle before service, how cool will it be for it to be confusing for our kids and our teenagers as they grow up and they get around someone who's heard culture's version of how you know faith is portrayed and sometimes it's Christian's fault that we're portrayed poorly because we, we live it poorly. 
but how cool would it be for our kids at our city church, our grandkids here, the church we're building, for when they get into one of those conversations someday, middle school, high school, college or whatever, and someone starts going off about how church is, but the one that was a part of our city youth, our city kids, our city church, they go, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I never had that experience. My church was dope. My church was amazing. They were great. There was adults, they dressed up like fools, <laughs> came to church, threw this big party, loved us, loved my friends. My friends didn't even believe what I believed, but when they came, they were treated like they did. They were wonderful to us. No one all agreed, but we knew how to love and care and, and to actually find enough unity on the things that Jesus does for all of us, which is he loves, he redeems, he forgives us. And we honed in on that at our church. So I don't know, man, like whatever, I'm sorry to hear you had a bummer experience, but that wasn't what I experienced at my church. That is what we are building. And that is where we're going um, to give them the confidence to answer that question and to be in that discussion someday.